Get some rest, Peter! <laughs> He was told, and Peter looked up. <laughs> Norman was nosing through his untidy, sweaty brown hair. We'll be here in the morning. <laughs> You're ours now, and we're not going anywhere, Peter. The, the goblin told him, pulling Peter's f f body flush against his own. Hello, I just wanted to thank you for clicking on my video, and I wanted to let you know, not only do I create content on my YouTube channel here, Class in a Glass, but I'm also on Twitch, where I play single-player games, multiplayer games, I do movie reviews, cartoon reviews, and a whole bunch of other stuff. Also, it would be a big help if you can check out my Patreon, where you can gain access to uh, audio commentaries, reactions, and the ability to submit questions for my podcasts and video casts. And all that content can be found in the links below. In the meantime, enjoy the video we're going to transition over to the general the general portion if you will the thick robust content of this stream and like i said chess is class in the glass cast for you ass of the sass where i read my very generous patrons patreon questions chat okay i don't just give them yes no maybe answers no no no, no. i i i i give you a lot i give you thick girthy well endowed curvaceous robust answers chat as much as you want and of course take a question in the chat too have a nice back what we go on tangents should we go off the we were going off of tangents and the we've been on i've been streaming for about an hour and already we're going on tangents it's good times shed is really good times read batman porn with the joker's voice oh batman the way you tickle my ass with your batarain <laughs> shut up stop stop laughing at me <laughs> I can't help it, Batman. You just get me so aroused. Shut up. No one can know about this. Ooh, I won't tell anyone yet. No. <laughs> Alex Bernal, thank you so much for giving us up to Michael the Collector. Very kind of you, good sir. Would you guys like me to do voices for the eroticism? That could be fun. You know what, chat? Oh, Green Goblin, finish it! Finish it! There goes Mr. <laughs> Could you imagine? Could you imagine, like, like whatever, the circumstances? But, <laughs> thank you. And another gifted sub from Alex Bernal to the friendly of tornadoes. The friendliest tornadoes. Thank you so much, Alex. A pleasure to have you here again. That would be perfect. If there's, like, you know, because it's Tobey Maguire, William Defoe Goblin, and, you know, it would it would lead to them, you know, Toby giving, you know, Goblin a blowy, right? You know, in the alleyway, in a New York alleyway. And, like, you know, Toby's like, oh, it's so much. And Goblin's like, finish it! Finish it! And then Goblin releases his web shooter into uh, Toby, you know? <laughs> Chad, I'm going to see if I can find that right now. I'm going to see if I can find that right now. We're going to find out together. Spider-Man... Green Goblin. <laughs> Happy holidays, everyone. Merry Christmas. Yes. Uh, Spider-Man, Green Goblin, erotic. Erotic fan fiction. <laughs> I'll give you a freebie. Erotic fan fiction. I'm Mr. White. Oh, Glee of the 1000 Bitty no Donation. Man. Thank you so much. Merry Christmas, you see. Wasn't she being? I am here, Glee. Thank you so much. I'm just looking up Goblin Spider-Man slash fiction. That's all I'm doing. I'm giving a gift. Uh, you gave me a gift. I gotta give, give something back to you. We gotta finish it. We gotta finish it, chat. <laughs> thank you, no, Glee. Seriously, thank you for that 1000 Bitties. Really appreciate it. You, you now get to pick an episode of a TV show for me to review in the future if you want to. That'll be Mr. fun. Whoa, and Devin the Great with the gifted sub. I think that's putting... Vanny! Excuse me, Vanny. I think we're gonna about to get juicy, Jeff. Are we getting juicy? Are we in the middle of a juicy... Uh, is it happening? There's was a cartoon poll that just popped up, so I wasn't sure. I don't know. I'm not sure if we're getting hype. Yeah, no, take all the time to think about it. Take all the time to think about it. Mm-hmm. In the meantime, Chad, in the meantime, let me go ahead and see uh, what we got here. Oh, is it high? Oh, we're at level two. Oh, shit. I'm sorry. The cartoon poll was blocked. I couldn't see it. All right. We're going to get... Sorry, Chad. We're going ah, to get juicy. Thank you guys for all the hype. Thank you for all the support. All those who, <laughs> who stuck around for that. Glee, thank you for the biddies. Jason, thank you for the biddies. Cassie, thank you for the biddies. 
Glee, thank you so much for all the gifted subs and for that 1,000 video. You're so kind, guys. Again, and thank you, Alex Bernal, for the gifted subs. Ripest Tomato with the Bitties. Thank you so much, guys. Everyone's been donating tonight. Really do appreciate it. Keeping the lights on a little bit longer, chat. Wow, we were indeed. Everyone in mom's family hates you. <laughs> yes, Glee. In you, uh, Ashki, Last Hero Episode 1. It's on Amazon Prime. Boom. There it is, chat. Chris Ayers. May you add it to the list. My infinite list, chat. My infinite list. Always never getting smaller, always longer. Always more things to do. Mm-hmm. Always season, but it's awesome. Now, I'm going to check it out. I'm going to review it. It'll be fun. And for the TV reviews, indeed. Very, very nice. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chad, for all the support. But now we must finish it. You thought I forgot, Chad, but I didn't. I didn't. I'm looking for that Green Goblin Spider-Man fan fiction. Let's see what we got. Just for this moment, Spider-Man fan fiction, Chad. I was thinking... <laughs> This is the description. This is the this is the synopsis. I was thinking about my next chapter for over, whatever that is. And suddenly, and I suddenly thought, what would it be like to have sex with the Green Goblin? <laughs> We're gonna find out, Chad. We're gonna find out together. <laughs> Here we go. Okay. Oh, it's always a, it's a, okay. oh, no, it's not, it's not too bad. It's not too bad, chat. Okay, here we are. So I like the details. So here's the deal. I've been up since 2 a.m. and I'm half asleep from working all day. Literally started at 3 a.m. and left my job at 9.30. And this idea popped into my head while at one of my jobs. I was thinking about my next chapter for over, I guess his previous fan fiction. And I suddenly thought, what would it be like to have sex with the Green Goblin? Not Harry, just the Green Goblin. And then I thought, I bet it'd be pretty hot if Peter had sex with the Green Goblin. <laughs> We're going to have a hell of a time, Peter. <laughs> Thank you, none of the 10 minutes. Oh, it's not over. Uh, and that's how this came to be. Keep in mind that I'm half asleep, <laughs> so if there are any mistakes, I apologize. Oh, don't worry, we'll hold it against you. Also, this is a pretty, <laughs> it's pretty much just born. I'm glad he's letting us know ahead of time. <laughs> no real story, just born, because why not? Anyway, let me know what you think. R&R, &R, enjoy. P.S. I was listening to As Long As Your Mind from Wicked... <laughs> And that's where I got the title from. <laughs> I don't own the title. He doesn't own the title, Chad. Uh, <laughs> Emily, my husband just came home about to tell me. No, 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 no. Keep this. Let her. Let him know what what, what you watch. Let him know what you watch. All right. <clears throat> All right. It starts pretty good. It gets it gets right to the point, Chad. It gets right to the point in the butt. Ah. Peter gasped loudly, his body shuddering and quivering as the goblin thrust into him. He clung to him, his blunt nails digging into the goblin's flesh. Peter's brown eyes were closed, crunched up in pure, unadulterated pleasure as he was fucked mercilessly by the bean he was straddling. Sharp teeth nipped at his neck before a hot mouth covered his tender flesh, sucking it hard with a rough tongue gliding over it every so often. Large hands <laughs> gripped Peter's bodies and pulled him against the exposed body of the goblin. His body rocked, rose, fell, and trembled in the goblin's arms. Peter couldn't help but moan loudly. <laughs> his body covered in sweat and tingling pleasantly with every touch. Every rough kiss, every caress. The Green Goblin's hold was possessive, and Peter knew that the other could easily kill him like this, being so plainly exposed and vulnerable. But he wouldn't. <laughs> this was something the Green Goblin wanted as well. And like Peter, he wasn't going to pass this up, not even for a chance to kill Spider-Man. <laughs> Fuck! <laughs> Peter gasped as his body rose with a particularly hard thrust. <laughs> oh. Oh, my God. <laughs> Being with Norman was nothing like this. Despite the fact that Norman and the Green Goblin were one the same, they were also so very different. How that worked, Peter didn't know and didn't really care at the moment. 
Whereas Norman would be gentle and loving one moment and then rough and demanding, the Green Goblin was straight up possessive and domineering. Not even for one moment letting Peter forget who was in charge. He was a beast, and he was fucking Peter Parker like there was no tomorrow. <laughs> He felt the goblin kiss up his neck, nuzzling him, nipping him, licking him, claiming him for all intents and purposes. Then his lips were brushing against Peter's ear, and his pace increased. <laughs> With every brush of the goblin's cock against his prostate, get very, get very anatomically correct, very biological, Peter thought he would come. He would be any moment now. He could feel it. Peter! <laughs> Peter, the goblin rasped into his ear, his voice harsher, rougher than Norman's, but still Norman. <laughs> You're ours now, Peter, <laughs> the goblin told him, and Peter would be damned <laughs> if that wasn't the hottest thing he had ever heard. Hell, the goblin... <laughs> Peter. <laughs> <laughs> the goblin could say anything in that tone of voice, full of lust, desire, and possessiveness. And Peter would be turned on by it. You belong to us, Peter. The goblin continued before he kissed his ear, nipping it slightly. Now, come on us, Peter. <laughs> Peter didn't need to be told twice. <laughs> As the goblin slammed into him hard and rough one last time, Peter came, <laughs> throwing his head back. He cried out into the night as he came all over the goblin's hand and both of their stomachs. His body shuddered violently, and his eyes were wide open, gazing unseenly to the ceiling above them. <laughs> While well, his hands gripped into the firm, hard body pressed against his own. <laughs> Chad, he was sleeping when he wrote this Give him a break, give him a break, come on <laughs> Somewhere within his orgasm haze <laughs> Peter felt the goblin come inside of him too Filling him with his sweet essence <laughs> His seed His green seed <laughs> A guttural growl of possessiveness A lot of possessiveness of this goblin resounded throughout the room as the goblin did so, and he bit down hard on the juncture between Peter's neck and shoulder. That only caused Peter to come again. <laughs> His final orgasm hitting him hard and sudden, completely unexpected. He loved it. He loved it, though, Chad. He loved it, though. <laughs> After what seemed like an attorney in the post-orgasm phase, <laughs> Peter began to come back down to earth. His body felt weak, and he slumped against the green goblin. Part of him was surprised that the other still felt so firm and strong, even after the three rounds of sex they had, but another part of him wasn't at all surprised. He would have chuckled a bit if he had the energy, but Peter didn't, and realized, and, and, uh, excuse me, but uh, Peter didn't, and instead, he just cuddled against the Green Goblin, feeling completely satisfied and ready for sleep. Get some rest, Peter! <laughs> He was told, and Peter looked up. <laughs> Norman was nosing through his untidy, sweaty brown hair. We'll be here in the morning. <laughs> You're ours now, and we're not going anywhere, Peter. The, the goblin told him, pulling Peter's f f body flush against his own, his arms encasing him possessively. <laughs> Again, I get it, he's possessive. Peter couldn't think that it was so strange that Norman and the Goblin seemed to think of themselves as two different people. After all, he basically saw them as two people, two entities in one body. But that didn't matter. Not now, maybe not ever, because all he could think about was how amazing the sex had been with the Green Goblin <laughs> and how he couldn't wait until he was able to do it again. And that was the very last thought that crossed Peter's mind before he fell asleep in Norman's Goblin Arms. End <laughs> of, of, of chapter one. <laughs> to fuck me, Willem. <laughs> there you go. So you can get that kind of content chat on my OnlyFans. <laughs> you can expect that. For Alex Pinal chat, he needs the vegan vegetarian meals. It's what he needs. Bravo. Thank you. <laughs> Web everywhere. <laughs> 
of chapter one, he says. Oh, there is much goblin fucking to be had in the future. <laughs> Cheers, Chad. <laughs> Cheers, salute to you. Oh, my Lord. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. Only Juicy fans, Chad. Join Only Juicy fans. Your description is healthy. Alex and all veterinary meals. Please subscribe today. Thank you. Keep Alex Caporeal. William to fuck. The story was not vegan. It was not vegan. <laughs> A lot of meat. A lot of meat in that story. <laughs> oh, my God. Well, Chad, we're going to go ahead and move on. <laughs> if we can at this point. Can we move on? <laughs> I'm all juicy now. <laughs> can we move on at this point? Oh, for those of you who stuck around, people are just like, I can't. People are like, I can't do this. <laughs> people are like, I got to leave. And they say that a hero can save us. I'm not going to stand in way. And they're fucking us, and they're fucking us, all the way. <laughs> oh, my Lord, thank you, Nye. Chad, we got to get to the questions. We have to get to tonight. You didn't think on a Christmas day, you didn't think a streamer would on a Christmas day stream, Chad, on Christmas day, December 25th, Chad, 2021, will be reading erotic Peter Parker and Green Goblin fan fiction, but I gave that to you, Chad. We're going to have a hell of a time, indeed. Oh, but, chat, we're going to start at the top. I'm going to read these in the order in which I have received them, chat. And the first question for tonight is from Stefan Henry. Uh, Ducking Henry, chat. Hey, Chris, happy holidays. I'm glad I found your show this year. Happy to have you be here, Stefan. Thank you. It's been a pleasure watching you grow. Oh, in so sorts of ways. I wish you nothing but good tidings for this Christmas and many more to come. My topic for this week is superheroes. Oh, good. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Question one. I know you've touched on this at times, but I'd like to know in detail what makes Peter Parker Peter Parker to you. Get better ask Norman. <laughs> ask Norman what makes Peter Parker Peter Parker. It's that thick ass. That thick spider ass. I'm totally destroying his question. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. What elements does this character need to be legitimately Peter in your opinion? And do these elements also apply for 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 Spider? Uh, and do these elements also apply for Spider-Man in general? For example, for me, Spider-Man needs to be a part of their community, both in the suit and out of it. That's why Miles works so well to me in both PlayStation Spider-Man and Spider-Verse Spider-Man. But he's still different than Peter. You know, I, you know. To your point, I do like the fact that. Yes, Peter can go and fight aliens. He can fight, you know, dictators in other countries. He can fight Doctor Doom, these global, uh, these universe-ending threats, these global-ending threats. And yet he always goes back to the neighborhood. He's always still, he always says, I'm a friendly neighborhood Spider-Man. And he's always, I think, been able to transition from, yeah, handing, handling these types of threats within New York City, whether it be battling the Kingpin or battling Green Goblin, among other villains, Shep, but then also dealing with these huge international and, and, and space threats all the time. And I love that about him, but inherently he is that character. I think, you know, in, in, uh, in Homecoming, Tony Stark said this, and so, did, uh, and so did Peter, where he's like, when he makes the decision not to join the Avengers, but to just be that friendly neighborhood Spider-Man, to look out for the little guy, chat. And I think Peter, it worked for Peter to be Peter, thoroughly is to always have that idea to always be like i'm always gonna look out for the little guy because he was that little guy and still is that little guy despite having these amazing powers chat despite fighting all these global threats being love and being hate he still is struggling to hold everything down he's still struggling with his relationship still struggling to pay the rent still still struggling against uh the various tragedies in his life chat to maintain some semblance of normal normalcy even though he'll never he'll never be able to hold on to that forever uh i think that 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 the neighborhood aspect to him is actually abs very important because we always go back to that eventually even if even if he is fighting all these threats or doing all these things or hanging out with the avengers the x-men he always goes back to that eventually which i like which is what happened in these new movies that we've seen which i've really enjoyed <clears throat> i think some other things that make peter peter is definitely his sense of humor you know he he was always so shy before he got his powers <coughs> excuse me chap before he got his powers he was shy he was bullied but he always hid this really great wit 
He obviously had a sense of humor, Chad. And I think because so many people made fun of him and mocked him, he basically he, he took that, he shouldered that, and he threw that back at his villains. And he's so great. I mean, that's what you always think of, like, when you want Spider-Man, you want Spider-Man to be funny. You want him to throw out those zingers. You know, making, like, call, calling Doc Ock a fat ass and stuff like that or anything else in between. It's, it's really funny when that happens. Or Kingpin. Uh, I love that. I think he needs, despite all this tragedy in his life, all this hardship, he still maintains. I mean, he, you know, he fucking, it's not always funny. Have you seen this in the most, the most recent films, Chad? You know, it's like, I ain't joking anymore. Uh, but he always has a great sense of humor, Chad. And it's that, you know, depending on what air we have. Like, you know, he's, he, he talks like a teenager. He talks like a kid. And I, and I like that. I like that he comes off that way. And I think they did a great job of that in, the, in, the, in this recent trilogy, Chad. And we also see that in, like, in the Spider-Verse movies as well. So definitely a sense of humor, Chad, and a humbleness, you know, because he came from very humble beginnings. He, he was a kid from Queens, you know, lived with his Aunt May and his Uncle Ben. Uh, parents are, are gone. They're, you know, they, they have a loving home, but they struggled to pay the bills just like he does in his adult life. And I think that's always kept him humble and also very understanding. And that humbleness and that understanding that has helped him throughout his career as a superhero, and it's also hindered him. <clears throat> he has a good heart. And you see villains take advantage of that a lot of the times, and it gets people hurt. It hurts him. But that is a big part of what makes Spider-Man – Spider-Man is that humbleness. Like, I love that the big theme of this movie is uh, – or the big, you know, the big plot point in this film is wanting to save people who may not even want to be saved because they need to be. Like, Peter could have – like, in that movie, I don't want to get into spoiler details, but <clears> – <throat> It could be so easy for him to deal with this problem. We're told how he can deal with this problem in this movie, and he decides not to. He decides, like, well, I, I can't do that. I want to help these people as best I can, even if they don't want to be helped. And he does that, and, it, and, it, and there's a cost, and there's a cost for that. We see that, and they handle that so well, but it's that, that humbleness that keeps him so human, so Spider-Man, chat. And the other thing is his willpower. It's his willpower. Uh... Like, unlike a lot of Marvel heroes, a lot of Marvel heroes fucking kill their villains quite often, especially in something like the MCU. I noticed that right off the bat, like, there's some people just, so many villains are just killing, or Captain America's like, I don't give a fuck. I've shot Nazis, I've shot Hydra, I will kill you, all right? That's how it's going to be. Same with Iron Man. He's killed all of his villains. Um, Peter, we see that in the first, we see that in the, his first standalone movie, in Homecoming, he's like, I'm not going to kill Vulture. He has every opportunity, he's like, no, and he's always trying to, save. that's a theme across all the films, when you think about it, he's trying to save <clears throat> He's trying to save Vulture at the end. And I'm sure he wouldn't have wanted to kill Mysterio. Mysterio brought it on himself because of his own arrogance and hubris and narcissism. Uh, and then we see that again here. And it's that willpower to not do the thing that would corrupt him. You know, to use his power to murder someone. Because um, <clears throat> that's usually when he's uh, done that, it's always a mistake. And it's hurt a lot of people. But I think those are the, those are the things that I think make Spider-Man Spider-Man. Eventually... He always goes back to the neighborhood. I think that was a great, <clears throat> excuse me, that was a great point to bring up. The sense of humor, the humbleness, and that willpower, chat. That's me. Good prostate, too. He also needs that prostate, chat. No question. <laughs> when you're fucking the goblin, when the goblin's fucking you. <laughs> it's true. Oh, my Lord. Marvel buff nerd, Merry Christmas to you. Hope you're doing very well, good sir. Welcome, welcome, welcome. An absolute pleasure to have you here just doing some class on the glass cast. What about you guys? What makes Spider-Man Spider-Man to you, August UCH? You a funny, funny... Oh, thank you, man. Thank you. I'm glad you're liking this, August. Finish me. Finish me, Peter. <laughs> sticky. It gets to be very sticky. Oh, it's time to get to the meat of the stream. <laughs> but that's for me. That's what I typically like. Like, even... I've never had an issue with him getting all, like, these gadgets from Stark and stuff from, the like, these movies. Because despite all that, he's still Spider-Man, despite those gadgets. And so I was never... That was never a concern for me that it's like, is he Iron Man? Just like, no, even the movies tell you he's never going to be Iron Man. No one can live up to Iron Man. Not even Tony could live up to Iron Man. Like, we see that in Far From Home, and I like that. They're drive That's always been driven home that he's not Iron Man. He's not his successor, you know? And he doesn't... He eventually figures out, like, I don't want that either. He, he figures that out in Homecoming. So I think it's really cool. And oh, and in Far From Home, one foot on street level, another in big events. Yeah, I like that. He's and he's that hero that you can use in all multiple genres, which which works out. You can tell a horror story. You can tell it's a, uh, it can be over top fantasy, and that's what's fun about that character. It's, it's cool to see him in, in environments that are outside of the neighborhood too. But he's always going back to that, which is nice. We have that consistency. Spider Man needs a gun. I'm <laughs> yeah, web shooters. Two hundred fifty bitties. Again, an absolute pleasure to have you. I'm glad you're enjoying yourself. 
Uh, you know all the new suits was Avi Radza here for making new suits. Oh, it makes sense. That makes sense. That makes sense. <laughs> yeah, there you go. You're right. You're right about that. Yeah, I can see that. Well, I do like the suits, so fair enough. You got that. You got that, Avi. You got that. Oh, but yeah. A great question, but those are for me, Chad. Like, always going, eventually going back to the neighborhood, despite dealing with various threats across the world and the universe. But his sense of humor, his humbleness, and his willpower to do the right thing, despite it hurting him so much. He knows he can't kill anyone, which I love that about that character. Question two, and we see that a lot across this trilogy, and I like that. I know you like the... Question two from Ducky Henry from Stefan. I know you like the idea of heroes stepping down and being either replaced or there being a different character stepping into their roles. Hence why you like Spider-Verse. Are, yes. Are there any superheroes you can't see losing the mantle, though? Do you think? Do you have a favorite character that just can't be replaced? For myself, it's Clark Kent and Superman. You know that? And the, and the answer is like, uh, no, because it's so open territory uh, at, at the moment. Like, because there might come up, like, yeah, I could say, like, I can't imagine a, no one being Batman. Batman should always be Bruce Wayne. But we eventually we saw Dick Grayson as Batman in the comics and some great stories. We saw Terry McGinnis taking over the role in the Batman Beyond animated series. And so it can be done. And so it's like Batman's one of the biggest heroes of all time, if not, if not the biggest, certainly for DC. Maybe Superman, but those are the top two you would consider, uh, you would figure. And so, even their most popular hero can have different versions. Spider-Man can have different versions, Chef. My, Marvel's, that is, that is their most popular character. And we see it. Look at all the variations of Spider-Man that we've got. Miles Morales, as you brought up. Uh, sp uh, it's several Spider-Women, Chef. Whether it be Jessica Drew or, most recently, Gwen Stacy in Spider-Gwen. Or Spider-Woman, as she's called in, in um, Into the Spider-Verse. Like, I, I like that. And so... Um, I have no issue with someone else taking over as as Superman. If if you find a good story, if you have a good character, I think that'd be fun. I wouldn't mind that at all. Or I mean, we've had different Green Lanterns. Everyone's like, well, no one can be Hal Jordan, but we got we had a uh, uh, John Stewart, and for a lot of people, that was their Green Lantern. If you watch the animated series for years, and Hal Jordan was gone, Wally West was Flash for a while, but then they brought Barry Allen back. It's like I I always want to keep it open for that because I think. If I have a criticism, if I have a big, if I have like a number one criticism against comics is that they're, they always go back to the status quo, always, because they're like, well, we can't make too many changes or we're going to have to reverse stuff or there has to be a big event, there has to be a crisis, there has to be a secret invasion where we are, all right, we clean the fucking board, here we go, back to basics. And that, I think, is frustrating because those writers might have been doing something really interesting with those characters, pushing them in, 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 in new uh, corners we haven't seen before or new variations of them or they've retired, and I don't mind that. It's like you can do that, but I feel like there is such a fear uh, from people, uh, from people that own DC or Marvel, that no, 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 no. like this, that, this, they have to. This pe person always has to be this particular character. Maybe we can do variations of it, but they have to be this. But I feel like audiences, uh, mass audiences, are very open to the idea of someone taking over the mantle, and so we can. I mean, go, and th th not to say that you can't. Like, okay, no more Bruce Wayne Batman stories ever. You could always have writers come in and do a Bruce Wayne Batman story. You could do arcs in these comics or an animated series or all these different things. Like, there's all, it's not like, it's like, okay, done, moratorium, zip, not, it's over. It's like, no, you can still do stories, but now you're doing these stories right here. And that is fun. And so, no, for me, there's not a single character, not a single character. Like, as much as I love, Matt, like, Matt Monarch Daredevil, I would be very interested to see what they could, if, and they never done it before. You know, they had, like, someone temporarily take over the mantle, like uh, Danny Rand. But, like, hey, if you want to do something, you want to have it where someone else takes over his roles, why not? I think it'll be fun. Just write a good story. Write a good story. And you, you convince me. Convince me. And they've done it. A lot of people have done it well. We've seen that for, for years. I know that there is this this pushback. It's like, no, they need to be the same. It's like, but yeah, but sometimes we've gotten a Miles Morales. We've gotten a Kate Bishop. We've gotten a Kamala Khan. We've gotten a Terry McGinnis. We've gotten a John Stewart. We've gotten a, a, a Wally West because they decide to make a change. And so I am very, very open for, for people to retire certain versions of characters and doing new takes on it. But as long as the writing is good, that's what it comes down to. As long as you're telling a good story, as long as the, as the character is interesting or fun, then I'm open for any changes. I'm not one of those comic book fans like, no. It's like, no. As long as you respect the tenets of what defines the hero. If, if you, if you, like, like I said for Spider-Man, I think Spider-Man should have these things. And that Miles has the same things that Peter does. And that's what works about him. He's within that neighborhood. He has a sense of humor. He has that humbleness. Just like Peter, he has that willpower that Peter has. But he's learning. He's cultivating this. He's being trained. And I like that. That's what works. If you, if you keep the basic tenets but change up 
who the person is under the mask. I think that's fun. I like that a lot. I like that a lot. So I'm open for that. What about you guys? Is there a character you just like, I can't see this. I cannot see this happening. Like, no, they're always going to be Batman, always be Superman, etc. For me, I'm very open for new things. I mean, we're seeing this recently. You saw it in Hawkeye chat where eventually, you know, Kate Bishop's going to probably be the new Hawkeye. Uh, which I'm open for. I really like Haley Steinfeld's take on that character. I think she was really, really fun. We're seeing that now with, um, uh, you know, we're seeing that now with um, uh, Florence Pugh's Yelena. She's gonna be the new Black Widow. I'm like, fuck yeah, and I like that's it. exciting. It's cool, and there's all potential new stories you can do. And we we saw that chemistry between uh, Kate Bishop and Yelena in the show, and I was like, every scene they're in, it's fucking dynamite. It's great, and so yeah, it, 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 you you you, uh, you have a lot of avenues for creativity. Um, Batman can get a Spider-Verse movie, Batman 66, Batman 89, Batman series, Terry McGill. I, you know what? I'm, I, I think I feel like there was a rumor like a while ago that they were going to do something like that. Or it was going to be like a Batman Beyond like animated movie. But they could if they wanted to. They could. I'd be like, why not? As long as you, you know, I mean, you know, they're definitely, you know, borrowing, stealing, if you will, from Spider-Verse. But hey, if you make it work, if it's fun, why not? But then I kind of took over as Daredevil when Matt Murdock went crazy. Child took over as protector of Hell's God. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I never read that, but I knew, I know of it. Uh, Roger Mazzu said, why not? I mean, he, he, you know, he's in jail right now, but who knows? Might reform. <laughs> Wonder Woman, maybe. Yeah, Wonder Woman would be cool. I mean, there's you could do so many different things with Wonder Woman. I would not mind that at all. Yelena's the best, see? And, you know, if, if we were like, no, Natasha's Black Widow, no one can else. We would have never had someone like Yelena. And I think, you know, it's a, why, why cut off creativity when it's like, let's be experimental. Let's try new things. And so, yeah, I'm not one of those guys that it has to be set in, you know, no, nothing changes. Because I think that's what's really choking the comic book industry is uh, a lack of variety when storytelling, when it comes to a lot of their characters, they're too afraid to do new things because they want to keep everything status quo. And that's been the thing that's been plaguing them for decades, though. So that's not a new problem. That's a consistent problem. But it's a great question. Uh, question three. I know you enjoy the dark and depressing superhero stories. I do. I do. The tragedy of the stories, that really hit me home. Uh, hit home for me. But it's Christmas, and it's all about cheer now. What are some of your favorite optimistic, uplifting, light superior stories that you enjoy? This brings a smile to that juicy face. You know what? It's funny, because I was like, oh, I got some, but I realized, like, wow, I do like a lot of dark comic books and superhero stories. That, that, that's kind of nuts. I mean, look at my Batman. Like, all Batman's comics. A lot of Batman's uh, comics are fairly dark, although there's some light ones. But I, 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 I did, like, okay, there are a couple that I can think of. Uh, All-Star Superman by Grant Morrison is is fantastic it's a love letter to superman and the weirdness of superman and his characters and what he means to people and what defines him the whole concept it's not a spoiler chat but the comic opens up where superman he's, he learns he's dying where a scheme from lex luther worked he's dying and he has a limited amount of time to spend with the people he wants to spend time with and he, he basically he's like i got this is you know I'm writing my bucket list right now. This is what I want to do with Lois Lane. This is what I want to do with Jimmy Olsen. This is what I want to do to help Lex Luthor. This is what I want to do for all these other people. And I'm like, I really, really like that. Where And it's a celebration of who he is and what defines him and what a good person he is. Uh, a lot of people say Superman's boring. It's like he's not boring. People have done boring things with him. People have, have messed up his, 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 his characterization and adaptations and things. But he's not a boring character. He's a great character. And um, I, that story celebrates what makes Superman great. I really like it because it's very intimate. It's very intimate. And, 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 it's, and it's happy, but it's also tragic at the same time. But it's great. So definitely, um, definitely All-Star Superman. Crossed. Is that the one where it's like rapey cannibals? <laughs> I don't know if that one. I don't know if I picked up. Batman Robin, a little too much of that. A little too much in one direction. Uh, Hawkeye, you know, recently, Chad, we just saw the Hawkeye adaptation for Disney+. Plus. I really enjoyed it, and it borrows heavily, heavily from Matt Fraction's Hawkeye run. So if you want more of that kind of Hawkeye, chat that has Kate Bishop, that has, um, you know, Clint Barton like that, where he's, he's, very, he's like, hey, I just live in an apartment trying to take care of my, uh, my neighbors and dealing with, you know, uh, everything from Kingpin to uh, the tracksuit mafia. Watch that. Or, excuse me, read that. Great story. Deals with some dark things, of course, but at the same time, it's still, it's very, very, it's very tongue-in-cheek. It's having fun with the material. And Deadpool. Like, Deadpool, I think, can definitely be violent, but uh, I, I, you know, there's, there's various Deadpool writers that have adapted, everyone from Daniel Way to uh, Brian Posehn or even... Um, Oh, shit, I'm trying to figure, not, not, you know, uh, I'm trying to think of, like, the writer uh, who, who not created Deadpool, but he did, like, this notable but Deadpool run in the 90s that defined the character. Uh, you, you always have, uh, what's his name, always taking credit for uh, the creation of Deadpool, Rob Liefeld, but he didn't, he's not the one that made Deadpool who Deadpool is now. Um, 
there is uh, uh okay, I'm trying to I'm trying to remember the writer of a particular Deadpool run, and it's great. That's what really gave Deadpool a sense of humor. Deadpool comics. Oh, I'm forgetting, Chad. I'm forgetting. Um, mm, I'm trying to remember. I should have wrote this down because I put this Deadpool there. I was like, oh, yeah, I know all the Deadpool runs. But now, like, ah, shit. Let me see if it's up here. Hold on. Let me see. Let me see. Let me see. 1990s. There we go. Um, no, not New Mutants. None of that bullshit. No, no, no. Not Rob Liefeld. Not Rob Liefeld. Uh, Joe Kelly. There it is. Joe Kelly, chat. Joe Kelly's run on Deadpool is what really made Deadpool Deadpool. That's that's the character that you see in Ryan Reynolds' film. That's who it is. And we owe that to Joe Kelly. He gave him the sense of humor. He gave him breaking the fourth wall. All that was him. And he did a great job with that. And that's been carried forward with a lot of other uh, writers for, for, for years. Like I said, Daniel Way and Brian Posehn and uh, uh, Christopher Remender. Or not Rick Christopher Remender. Rick Remender. Who he, now, the comic is dark. His, his uncanny X-Force, but it's so fucking good. And but that gives you like a really wholesome Deadpool where he's on this. He's not he's an X-Men finally, but he's on the Black Ops X-Men team. That's the stuff that you do where, you know, we can't have that out there. People knowing about it and it's led by Wolverine. And he has Archangel. He has Psylocke. He has uh, Phantom Axe and he has Deadpool and some, some other recurring uh, members as well. And we see a Deadpool who's not really he's still I mean, he still has that sense of humor. But he's not crazy anymore. And I kind of like that where he's he's very much in control of his, uh, his faculties now. Um, he, he says scarring is gone at this point and his cancer is gone and, you know, he's realized that, you know, he's still funny, he's still cracking jokes, so don't worry about that, but he does have a, I think, he's always, he's always had, he's, he's grown over time, his sense of morality, it's always, he's always had a heart of gold despite what he says or does sometimes, like, he, he does have a lot of people's best interests at heart, it's just that he's insane, uh, and this one, he's cured of that and he wants to be a, he actively wants to be a better person and he kind of gravitates to, he becomes like a father figure for, uh, uh, Apocalypse, who has died and he's been reincarnated in this child, like this 11, 12-year-old boy, and Deadpool is like, one of the missions that they have to go on, it's like, okay, we gotta kill Apocalypse, and Deadpool's like, I'm not fucking killing that kid, I'm not doing that, and it, it, him and Wolverine come to head on this, and I really like that, and he becomes kind of like a father figure for this young Apocalypse, and I really, really like that. Yeah, so that, that, that's big, that, those are those some of the really uplifting ones, even with some characters you don't think. You know, uh, didn't the creator of Naruto keep making the manga because it was making money? I heard he wanted to. End. Oh, see, I don't know. Now I'm not sure. Do you did you like Deadlift too? I don't think I ever read that. I don't think I ever read that. Yeah. Mm. So yeah, just uh, like you know, c comics that are uh, not so much dark, but they're a little more whimsical, wholesome, more comedy centric. Maybe uh, they bring a small up uplifting superhero stories. And so I talked about, like, Deadpool, you know, uh, various runs with him, with Joe Kelly making that character who he is, and then later on, Deadpool can be more wholesome because he's cured of his insanity as cancer. And I really like that. I think Joe Kelly helped make that cartoon. Oh, is that him too? Oh, fuck. Look at that. That's cool. Good for him. Still working. I was wondering what he's doing. Nice. Very, very nice, Jeff. But yeah, just to reiterate, Hawkeye by Matt Fraction, also Superman by Grant Morrison, and Deadpool by various writers, particularly Joe Kelly and um, Rick Remender. Recommend those, Jeff. And now I think we have, uh, oh, that was it. That was the last question. As always, it's a pleasure to be a part of your community. I appreciate just how cool you and the rest of your fan base is. And I appreciate how you are always looking to improve and grow. Thank you, man. That's what I'm trying to do, chat. As I say, uh, I really want you to give me feedback. You know, if something's not working, you feel this can be improved, let me know. I, I want to make it better. And as we go in this new year, work out some new content I think you guys are going to like. You know, we're talking about the music thing. Got a few other things planned. Going to give maybe things a little bit of a facelift, update things to a degree. So, yeah. Harley Quinn, yeah, there's some great Harley Quinn comics. Another good one. Another good choice, Sage Snake. Very nice, very nice. Kind of like the um, the the new animated series with Harley Quinn, which I really like. I mean, they deal with some dark stuff, some dark material, but there's also some really fun, whimsical, wholesome moments between a lot of those characters, which I like. But thank you again, Duck and Henry Stefan, for being a for being a subscriber on the Patreon. Appreciate you, good sir. Happy to have you be a part of it as well. Thank you, thank you. And now, Chad, we'll move on to Vanny Vanisphere's movie question. It takes two tackles the pretty serious topic of divorce. And impact on a family. There have been so many movies that tackle divorce and with differing tones. Mrs. Doubtfire took a more comedic, albeit deranged approach, while Marriage Story made it super real. Which film do you think handled divorce the best, be it silly or realistic? I'm just gonna see if uh, I'm just see if uh, I missed something from Vanny. Hold on, 
I want to make sure I didn't miss an opening sentence from him. Da, da, da. Sometimes that happens when I copy stuff over. Nope, just talking about It Takes Two. Cool. Uh, well, I would say probably Marriage Story. Yes, it's a little more dramatic. And it's, it's, it's um, you know, it's, I mean, fuck, we have two people who are fighting over their child and their lives are kind of falling apart and they're going to lawyers who are telling them different things. And, you know, Robin Williams is lying to his family and he's dressing up as a uh, Scottish nanny. <laughs> And trying to get, a, 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 you know, under these court-mandated visitation rights. And so, <laughs> you know, it's, I love Mrs. D I love Mrs. Doubtfire. It's a great film. It's one of Robin's great comedies. It's so funny. Uh, I mean, you can, you can, you can, there's so many iconic moments in that movie. But when you really think about it, it's really fucking disturbing. <laughs> like, what he's doing, Chad. It's like, yeah, you should, you, you should not ever see these goddamn kids again <laughs> for what you fucking did, what you've done, you know. But, but it does, add, but, you know, even when after it, his secret's revealed in that movie, and he's like appearing at court now and everything. And, like, he's talking to the judge and just, like, if you have anything to say yourself, is just, like, how can you even quantify this one example? He talks about how he, now he, there's, like, a, a, a person there, a social worker that has to be there watching him as he has his kids. And the social worker asks him, uh, you know, because he says, you know, he says, like, I love my child. And the person asks me, in what way do you love your child? Why do you love your child? And he says, isn't that, and he basically, he's coming down, he's like, how can you even answer a question like that? As how just incredibly hurting that comment is. You know, I mean, what he did is awful. I mean, as he got in hindsight, it's like, yeah, it was, it was a bad move. But it's like, wow, that's handling that in such a mature way. And so despite being, oh, goofy comedy where one was wearing a fat suit, which kind of is, Chad, it's, it's one of the, it's kind of is the best fat suit comedy of all time. It's up there at the very least. It's so good. Uh, but Marriage Story also handles it, again, if you, that was like 2019, the year of a hell of a way to end the decade, chat. So many great films that year, and I love the way that movie handles a divorce and how, like, oh, we kind of got things figured out and things, but we're friends, but it's like, not really. And how susceptible they are to people influencing their behavior and their resentments, which they constantly downplay because they never really talked about them before, and now they're bubbling up and people are capitalizing on that. Like, you have the lawyers for both Adam Driver and um, uh, Scarlett Johansson, respectively, and how they're so good at poking certain buttons and getting a reaction out and pursuing all these legal actions. It's like, yeah, it's probably what happens. People get taken advantage of, and it's great. If you've never seen either movie, chat, Mrs. Doubtfire or Marriage Story, do yourself a favor and do so. But I think, you know, <laughs> I think maybe Marriage Story handles it better, and, but Mrs. Doubtfire handles it well, but it's, again, it's, it's in a more comedic fashion, of course. But it's still great. It's still a, 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 a beautiful movie. Uh, it is the exact reason why I never did family. Yeah, yeah, just uh, that that would be really hard because you have to be like, I gotta manipulate these people so we can get everything out of the other person, the the wife or the husband, whoever you're representing. So yeah, but yeah, I I mean both do it well. I mean you know this is Doubtfire. Have you ever seen the horror trailer for Mrs. Doubtfire? It's fucking horrified, Chad. It's so creepy. Uh, but yeah, I think both handle it well. You know when when Mrs. Doubtfire does get serious, I'm like this is pretty good. It, it made me cry. It made me cry. Both movies I think made me cry. It's great. Very good. Netflix best movies always seem to come out in November, December. Oscar season, man. Don't Look Up was great comedy like Idiocs. I got to check that out. I've not yet seen that. I don't know if I'll be able to watch it before the end of the year, but I do want to check that out. Very nice. Very nice chat. And now we have a TV question. The Book of Love, Dr. Akeem, has been a major point of contention for us. Very much so. Well, I wouldn't say that it's a low point in the game. His presence has been a bit of over the top, and this game has a squirrel B war in it. True. Ultimately, though, it does look like the book means well and does drive the story along. I mean, he, he, he fixes it, or at least he makes it better. In TV, especially 90s sitcoms, you've seen a lot of over-the-top characters. Urkel from Family Matters, Joey Gladstone in Full House, Bulldog from Frasier, Kramer from Frasier. Or is Kramer from, um, uh, 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 always, uh, Jesus Christ, I was say always sunny. Uh, Kramer from Seinfeld. Who is your favorite over the top character in all of TV dumb? I got a couple, chat. I mean, I could literally say the entire cast of always, uh, it's always sunny in Philadelphia because they're all horrible people. Always sunny is like the evolution or the de evolution of Seinfeld, chat. It's like, yeah, like Seinfeld's a show about nothing, about awful people being awful to each other. Uh, but always sunny takes that and just makes it despicable. <laughs> Like, even worse. And they do it so well. It's a great show. But Charlie, Charlie Kelly, Charlie Kelly it probably is, you know, the the guy you would say is so over the top. And it's ridiculous. Everything from his love of ghouls to him, like, snuffing and eating glue 
uh, and having milk steak. Like he's just, he's just, he's a broke, he's a broken man. There's something physically and psychologically wrong with him. But I'm sorry, Chip, I got to go with Frank Reynolds. Who you think, like, okay, how did, like, D and uh, uh, Dennis get so much? Oh, because they're father, of course. <laughs> now it'll make why, why Dennis is a serial killer and, and D is constantly dealing with her own uh, narcissism and a variety of other problems, chat. Uh, it's because of Frank, no doubt about it, because of that, that marriage to his whore of a wife. But Frank, Frank is, is, is a huge part of the reason why so many of his characters are fucked up, because he's a schemer, and he's like, knows what he's doing, too. Like, you, you can say, Dennis is clearly a sociopath, D has, uh, I mean, she suffers from depression, and, uh, she's a narcissist. Charlie is, is insane, and he's physically and emotionally stunted, and Mac also suffers from uh, narcissism chat, and he has a confused sexual identity that he needs help with. Uh, but but they, and as you can say, like, okay, you can at least make excuses for why they are the way. Frank has no excuse. Frank, I know, he, he's come out as gay recently, but, like, for the entire series, it's always like, okay, is he gay? <laughs> like, I think he's gay. Like, he's never admitting it, though. He can never admit it until recently. But Frank is the only one that knows what he's doing constantly, and I think that's what makes him so horrible. Is he's always aware. He's never not always like, I know what I'm doing. I mean, he literally made all of his money in fucking sweatshop chat and in, in human trafficking. I mean, he doesn't care. Just bury me. And he's like, and he says this. He's like, just bury me with the trash because he's like, I'm trash. I'm a horrible human being. And I'm like, and I, but we love him. We love these people, despite how awful they are and their effect that they have on so many people it's so awful but i love me some frank reynolds chat he's pure i want to be pure and he is pure fucking evil pure despicably evil chat and then there's some other characters too i think are really over the top and funny uh dwight shoot from the office i think he's great i mean i could see that character getting really annoying the thing that works is like you have um you have jim in the office and, you know, he's the pretty guy, and he's sarcastic, and he's very lackadaisical. And you're like, okay, you can just like, oh, you like him. But you're like, ah, oh, this guy can get kind of like, come on, man. Do your goddamn job. But then when you encounter someone like D Dwight, who is so annoying, and clearly there's something, you know, wrong with him, you know, no doubt. But he's just always on everyone's ass. And he's just he's just that annoying office worker. It's like, stop. Just stop talking. We'll go home. And Jim's like, you know what? I'm going to fuck with you. And it's great. And you, yep. It's like, yep, you have to. You 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 feel sorry for Dwight, but then he does something really shitty. It's like, nah, he deserves it. <laughs> he absolutely deserves it for his various comments. <laughs> so yeah, definitely Dwight Schrute from The Office, and also Andy uh, from uh, Chris Pratt's character, Andy from Parks and Rec. He's just a big Labrador. He's like a dumb golden retriever. It's like he's just so f fun and stuff, and he's like he has the mind of a child. And he's he's immature, but there's like a lot of wholesomeness to him. So you can't say, "Ha, ah, Andy." You know, it's like that's why that's why everyone says his name. Like especially, um, oh god, what's her name? Um, oh Jesus Christ, I forgot the, the character, the main character of the show, chat, <laughs> whose 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 name I absolutely uh, forgot. Um, wow, I'm blanking, chat. You know, I'm tired when I can't when I'm starting to just completely bungle names. Um, but the head of the Parks and Recs department. I love, she's like, Andy, like, that's how she never says, like, Andy. She always says, Andy, because he always did something probably bad or wrong. And I love him. I'm going to look up this person. It's driving me fucking nuts. I'm going to look up Parks and Recs. Parks and Rec. I can't believe I forgot. I'm going to be like, of course. Amy Poehler, Jesus Christ, it's going to be so long to figure it out. Amy Poehler, chat, there we go. Like, I love that. Andy from Parks. Yeah, yeah, Andy from The Office. Oh, they're, well, they're so similar to each other. It's that mockumentary style. It's great. I felt the, the pits on uh, made me laugh. Oh, there's so many good stuff. So much good stuff on either. So Jack and, and Karen from... That's true. They're funny, too, and they're over the top as well. I like their friendship. I like their relationship. Good pick, Casfe. Very good. Very good. Uh, oh, did I... Am I still here, by the way, chat? Is the stream still on? Is we're still working? Daryl McCoy, welcome to stream. Merry Christmas. Happy holidays to you. Hope you're doing well. I just want to make sure the stream's working. Uh, oh, Archer, there's so many kind of characters in there. See, you good? Okay. It just says there was a network error, so I don't know if that might, might be on my end or okay. I think we're good. We're good. Okay, it's still working nice. Nice, nice, nice. But yeah, Archer has all those chaotic characters. I mean, Krieger, definitely Krieger and Cheryl slash Carol. Carol Tunt, as she's called, yeah. So definitely that. I'm good, cool. Very, very nice, very nice. Uh, but moving on from that question, we're on the Vanny's video game question. One of the craziest things about playing It Takes Two has to be how absolutely misguided Cody and May are. Yes, they're dumb. I mean, the elephant scene hurt. Oh, Cutie the Queen Elephant, chat. Oh, my God. 
No. It's fair to say that up through that point, we are the villains of the story since the goal is to make our Donna cry and to commit regicide, to commit murder. They've uh, There have been a few games where the hero is actually the villain, like Braid or Spec Ops the line. True. Which game surprised you? And Braid, your abusive boyfriend, right? Which game surprised you the most, the big reveal, that you've been the bad guy the whole time? I mean, you know, probably the, the best one I can think of. I mean, it's, it's one of the most moments that blew my fucking mind when I was a kid, Chad. And that was in Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic, Chad. Star Wars KOTOR. KOTOR, indeed. And it was the reveal after this entire time when you're going on this journey to find this, basically the MacGuffin of the, of the game, and you encounter the villain, who you perceive as, like, oh, the main villain. Uh, and he's like, oh, hey, hey, dude, hey, what's up? And you find out that you were this guy's master, his Sith master, Darth Revan, chat, one of the most powerful Sith Lords of all time. The Jedi, they raided your ship, you got knocked out, and they destroyed your mind and put it back together again like some fucked up jigsaw puzzle, and you're not even know who you are. And so that was huge, Chet, the bigger villain. I'm the villain. These aren't, I'm not having visions. These are my memories. That's what this, this is. And I've been exploited by so many people. I've been exploited. If you're a male Revan, you've been romancing vastly you've been exploited by your love interest uh you've been exploited by the jedi council and it really puts the jedi in a super negative light but like they destroyed this person they're just using him as a tool not as a person and it's really really great so i kotor the revenue reveal absolutely huge uh the last of us with joel chat where you know you know like you you get the sense that throughout this game joel's done a lot of bad things throughout it you know from the past things that he references talks with various characters and with ellie but the very end you find out it's like you know i am too selfish to to let this girl die because what she has could potentially save the world cures of this of this major pandemic he's like fuck that i want to replace him for my daughter and he kills all those people chat he murders everything and he wants her for herself he could have saved the world and he said fuck that i know me 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 he's incredibly selfish chat in the end and i still like him as a character but he's a son of a bitch and it has serious consequences and it's later on to the series, Shane, and also at the end of that game, where he also chooses to lie to her, saying she confronts him before you go to the compound, your brother's compound. She's asking, are you telling me the truth? Is what you're saying what happened? He says, yes. And she says, okay. And that's the last thing. And then, you know, truth obviously comes out, and Joel pays for it. He pays for a chat. And, I, and he kind of deserved it. <laughs> uh, Nico knows tag. Good to see you, Nico. Hope you're doing very well. Talking about, uh, well, Talking about uh, big reveals in games where you're actually the villain, which is really fun. This is Class on Glass Cast, a little Q&A where I don't just give you yes, no, maybe answers. I give you thick, robust, girthy answers. It's what I do. And it's a pleasure to have you. Bioshock 3. I'm not a big fan of Bioshock's three story, but yeah, the reveal that you're actually uh, Zachariah. What's his name? Zachary Zebedee? Zachariah Comstock. That was pretty cool. I like. I was like, oh, yeah, I'm the villain the whole time. Or at least a version of me was the villain. It's like, interesting. Uh, another dimensional travel was the villain. Doing well. Thanks for the asking. How's the stream going? The stream's going great, man. It's been a fun Christmas Day stream. Talking with the people. Having some great conversations. Asking people's uh, days are going. Reading, you know, erotic Spider-Man goblin fanfic. You know, typical things that people do on Twitch streams. It's fun stuff, Nico. It's fun stuff. Also, I have one last answer, and that's Shadow of the Colossus chat, where you play as this character named Wander with your trusty steed, and you have this love of your life you're trying to save, and the only way you can save the love of your life is by murdering these colossi, chat, by, by you know battling these colossi, absorbing their souls, and you realize, like, as you play gameplay as long, it's like, I think I'm causing, like, an extinction-level event, and because of what all, all these deaths you're causing, your appearance starts to change, you start to look more demonic, chat, and you realize, like, oh, I'm the villain because the character much like Joel, is too selfish. He's dooming the world. He's dooming this entire species because he can't let go of his, the love of his life, his wife, his girlfriend, whoever. And that has serious consequences. And a lot of people die. A lot of people get hurt. But definitely uh, wanders. I played the Morgan. I started to hate the character I was playing because I didn't want to kill the Colossus. At first, you're like, oh, fucking cool. I got to kill these things. But then you're like, I don't want to kill these things anymore. And I love that. And so definitely shout out the Colossus chat. So top three, if I had to think where I'm like, wow, I'm the villain. KOTOR, I love that reveal. Especially if you're playing light side and you're like, oh my God, that's not even who I am. The Last of Us, of course, uh, with Joel. And shout out the Colossus with the character of Wander chat. Some big ones. I like the reveal in Bioshock 3. We actually went over my head the first playthrough. Uh, though that, that you're that another version of you that Comstock, like Comstock has to die in order for this to all get fixed. Yeah. Yeah, it's cool. It's a cool little reveal. I like it. I thought it was handled better in the DLC, the Barrel at Sea DLC. I was like, oh, and then it felt more complete because Bioshock and Infinite and 2, they're all connected once that DLC was like, oh, now I understand everything. So it helped me like that ending more. It improved the chat. 
And then, Joe, we have a content creator question. It Takes Two has been an absolute blast to play a few. The game changes, themes, mechanics, genres, silly team. That never gets old. True, I love that about it. It's never, it never sticks around for too long. We're like, you get bored. I appreciate that. You recently announced a whole new slew of shows, Patreon benefits. What brought on the idea to switch things up? I mean, people are asking for other things. You know, people have always asked me, like, will I talk about music? Uh, well, I listen to this album or things, and I was like, you know what? There's something there. I can do something with that. I can make a show, uh, and I just have to find like you know the right process to do that, and it'll be fun. And so it's a uh, you know it's it's giving people what they want, you know, taking feedback and acting on it, not just brushing it aside and going, yeah, all right, thanks, whatever. No, I want your feedback, guys. Like it's really really important to me. So that's been that, that's a big reason, and I just want to address maybe some of my ignorance on topics, chat. You know, I as you know, I'm like I've, I've said I'm ignorant when it comes to music, and I don't want to be anymore. Like I want to actively learn. I want to learn, chat. I want to learn. I want to get better. And so I figured that would be really really fun. That'll be really fun to do, and uh, yeah, I'll be adding. I'll be announcing some other stuff too, which I'm excited about. I'm hoping you guys will react well to it. But yeah, we'll go forward and see what happens. But, yeah, it's, it's it's just you know giving people what they want, correcting things that I feel like need correct that need to be rectified. Chat, and thank you. To Nico for the follow as well. You're my new Hulkamere, my new Grinch. Hope you're doing well. Not very typical. You haven't spent most stream talking about being a streamer, and you also don't throw let's go in every other sentence. You also don't use fuck as a universal shape. Now, oh, thanks, man. <laughs> you should see the rest of my streams. <laughs> Learn the flute. Now, playing an instrument uh, or training to use an instrument, that might be difficult. I have no time for that. But, uh, but yeah, there's just a couple of things that I'm, I'm going to be announcing in chat that I'm excited about. I hope you guys like it too. And who knows? It'll also change over time. The aesthetic of the stream might change a little bit. So it'll be good. Turismo, good to see you. I'm doing well, Turismo. Merry Christmas to you. Happy holidays to you, whatever you're doing. Hope you're having a very nice weekend, very nice Saturday. Just uh, doing my class in a glass cast for you. Some of the sass. It's what I do. Juice is well spoken, especially when talking about nurture and hentai. Ah, you know that. You know that, Glee. Mm -hmm. Very, I'm very articulate when it comes to the hentai. Animated is hentai, live action, San Diego porn. In case you didn't know. It's true. I know, so you don't have to, Chad. I, I hold on to that Cthulhu knowledge for you. It's hard. It's hard. It's a weight chance. It's an albatross. Uh, but now, Manny's voice acting question. Chad, voice acting question. One thing I found interesting about It Takes Two is that Cody is clearly an American. Possibly from Jersey. He's got that accent, Chad. He sounds like, he sounds like me. And May is British. Do you have any theories as to why they made the choice? Do you think it was to elaborate on how different they both are along with the whole opposites attract thing? Or was it just the Annabelle Dow, the voice that just did a damn punch? She did a great job. Her, she, her voice acting was spectacular. I, I, um, yeah, I was thinking about that because it's weird because clearly, we're like, I, I, maybe I feel like we're living in the UK or like in the 90s or something. Because definitely, we, as we play along, it's like, okay, there's a lot of like dated technology. So it feels like maybe like a mid 90s, maybe uh, early 90s game, which I thought was cool. Um, maybe even late 90s. And because there's just like, you know, the computers and some of the technology. And I was like, oh, interesting. But uh, I feel like, yeah, I think that was, was more of a way to like, okay, to really showcase how different these people are. Let's change them up. They're, they're also from two different countries. They have two very distinct accents. And maybe that's also like a gameplay thing. So when a character is talking to each other or to do something, you don't get confused. Like, oh, who said that? So if it's two British people, maybe. Not to say that all British people sound the same or that all Americans sound the same. Maybe that was like, okay, in order for the person to know who a character is talking to who, we have to make sure their voices sound starkly different from each other. And so I think it's both a narrative thing, but also featured into the gameplay so there's no confusion because it's a co-op game, chat. And I really like that. So I, I feel like it's both of those things. And it, and it does it well. It does it well. And it also differentiates their personalities. I like, I like Cody's voice and I love um, May's voice. They do a great job. I want a divorce, bruv. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Teresa, well, thank you. It's same to you, sir. Just finished getting on my PS5. Well, I got one. Congratulations to you. That's awesome. Americans are considered brutish by some, so maybe it could be that. It's like, oh, yeah, yeah, of course, the husband. The the fat, smelly husband. He's gonna, he's brutish. They give him an American accent. Could be. Yeah, I, th I think it was, it was done for narrative reasons, uh, but also... Unless you said differentiate the personalities, but also for the gameplay itself, so people don't get confused while playing the co-op game. So like when Kirby goes like, "Do this, do that," it's like, "Oh, who said that?" So I think it's that. I think it's that. Uh, but yeah, it's 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 a, it's a great game, Chad. Definitely in my top five of the year. I can see why it's taking. I can definitely see why it ta it it takes home as winning game of the you know game of the year for a lot of publications and websites and things. And most recently, the Game Awards. It's great. I'm like, I totally get it. This year's hard because you know I know people are saying this is a weak year. I don't think it's a, like I don't. I mean, it's definitely less than usual. Not as maybe big, like, AAA, like, console exclusives, you can say. But, um, you know, for, like, like Sony or Microsoft, maybe. Uh, certainly Sony. 
However, uh, there's still some great games this year. Everything from Psychonauts to, to Deathloop and It Takes Two, as I said, Resident Evil Village. You know, there's some fun stuff. I really like it. I was with you, Mr. Evans, until I remembered the fidget. This fidget. Oh, yeah, that's right. You're true. The fidget spinners. Hmm. That's a good. I totally forgot about the fidget spinners. You're correct. So maybe it's not. Oh yeah, that puts that puts uh that 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 switches it around then because there's fidget spinners and that's a modern day thing. But why did all the stuff look so old then in the house? Maybe it's just old stuff they just don't know what to do with because they're going. Maybe they're digging up stuff in the house. Like all right, we got to separate all this crap. Could be that then. So yeah, maybe it is modern. You're right. Yeah. Uh, Nico, oh snap, you're in my area. I film out of Santa. What? Checking out your content. Oh, thank you, Nico. Yep, I have multiple platforms you can check out. Uh, obviously, here on Twitch. I have a YouTube. I have a Patreon. I have an OnlyFans. Uh, I'm also part of Double Toasted, which is an entertainment organization where we review uh, movies and TV shows and talk about nerdy stuff and pop culture stuff. It's fun. It's great. Welcome to the community. Welcome. You're a juicy gangster. You're a Revenite right now. It's great to have you. Mm hmm. It occasionally does get depraved occasionally, so just, just, I'm forewarning you, I'm forewarning you. So there's that. Ah, Steam sales, oh, I know, I gotta look, I, I, I've I prevented myself from looking, but I might check it out later tonight, if I'm not too tired, but I am feeling pretty tired, chat. COVID still affecting the less of, true, true, Ellen Kill, including game production, including game development. Hmm? Guardians of the Galaxy's up there, too, that's one of the, that's a great game. Yep. See, I'm, I'm out of school, so I never experienced fidget spinners in the classroom, but I imagine it was just awful. Is awful. Double Toasted is the media organization. Here, I'll go actually send you a link. Send you a link to their uh, Twitch channel if you want to check them out. Um, they got some good stuff. You can see me. I'll actually be on there tomorrow, um, mostly. Oh, shut up. Pass me. Um, we're going to be doing stuff. Probably Christmas movie reviews and things. Should be fun. Chats, tune in for the Sunday service. Just be Corey and myself because I think believe Martin is, uh, Martin is uh, away for the holidays. So there you go, Chad. There's the link if you want to check that out, too. They're on Twitch, and they have a website and everything else. Let me go back to my page, too, Chad. Boom! There it is. Very, very nice. And now, Chad, we're going to get to our last questions, which, again, hey, Thunderly, or excuse me, um, uh, Vanny, Vanny Spheres. Check out Vanny Spheres streams, too, Chad. Give that man some support. Follow him, subscribe to him. Do it to his only a Manderville man cam. Uh, thank you, sir, for being a Juicy Games subscriber. Thank you for your patience and your kindness. You're a very good friend, my friend. And now we're going to get to M. Xavier's questions, but I'm going to take a brief break. I need some Wawa, Chad. I'm so thirsty. So please give me a minute, Chad, as I grab some more tea. I'll be right back. Stick around. We're going to get to these next couple of questions, Chad, from M. Xavier, and then Thunder Lee, and we'll be wrapping this up. Here we go. Indeed, it's Sunday already, Chad. It's Christmas Day no more. It's still Christmas in my heart, Chad. still Christmas in my heart. But we're going to go ahead and move on to M. Xavier's question. He has one question for us, Chad. It's a good one. I, I like this one. It's nice. I think there's going to be a lot of variety from you guys, especially uh, depending on what your age is. I just watched Nightmare Alley the other day and uh, really enjoyed it. Aside from Pacific Rim, the Hellboy movies, I'm not too familiar with Del Toro's filmography, really. After watching Nightmare Alley, I now want to watch more of his films. Has there been a movie that you watched from an established filmmaker that made you want to go and watch their previous films? Yes, but I would tell you right now, man, so if you want to explore some of Del Toro's filmography, so you've seen the you've seen Pacific Rim, you've seen Hellboy, the Hellboy uh, uh, movie and its sequel, and most recently Nightmare Alley, I really implore you to, uh, to check out um, uh, the, the Devil's Backbone, great period piece, supernatural uh, film, uh, film, and uh, Pan's Labyrinth. Those are the those are the first two I'll tell you right now to watch. Put those on your docket right there. Those are great. That's Del Doro doing what he does best. It is like these really human raw stories, but he has a nice little supernatural element that doesn't feel overbearing, overwrought, or overly complicated. Those are the next two. Call me Hazel. Merry Christmas. Call me Hazel. Good to see you. She controls your fate. She controls your fate, chat. It's true. Nico, very cool. I will check out Dumbledore. I don't have much of a Twitch presence, but they're open to collab with the YouTuber. Yeah, yeah. No, man, I, I'm very happy to be a, be a part of them. They're great. They're they're they they've been doing this for a lot longer than I have, and you know, on various platforms for years. They were on cable access, or not cable. They were on yeah. They were on uh, Access TV, and they made the jump to uh, the web, the World Wide Web, and then uh, Twitch now, most recently. 
And there have been different iterations of them over the years, which is really cool. And it's a pleasure to be a part of it, too. It's been a great journey. But to answer your question, M. Xavier, there are several. Christopher Nolan, I think. I'm, I wonder if this will be, like, a popular answer for a lot of people. Because, like, my first Christopher Nolan movie was Batman Begins. I think for a lot of us it was it was Batman Begins, you know? And he did his he did his trilogy. But that I love Batman Begins so much, even before I saw The Dark Knight. So I saw it, like, three times in the theater. I loved it. And it made me want to check out his other works. And I'd watched uh, Insomnia with Al Pacino and Robert Williams, which was amazing. I also saw Memento, which was great, chap. That was so goddamn good of uh, Guy Pierce. And I never, you know, I've only seen a little bit of his other film. Uh, I think it's called The Following. But I want to watch all of that uh, someday. But it made me check out those two movies. And yeah, Chris Ronaldo is high on that list. Uh, Martin Scorsese from me. White Thank you, Christmas. Jason the Ten Bitties. I also Snow. like Shape of Water uh, from. Uh, oh, that's another one. Yeah, go ahead and check out Shape of Water. You can watch a woman fuck a fish. She fucks a fish, yeah. It's good. Uh, but yeah, no, Martin Scorsese. I, uh, you know, I had seen. Oh boy, I think I think my first Martin Scorsese movie was Gains of New York. It was like it was the early it was like what 2000, 2001, I want to say. And so this is before I even saw something like Goodfellas. I saw Gains of New York in the theater. I remember cuz my aunt, I think she took me to the movie cuz she had read the book that, you know, the Gains of New York movie is kind of based off of or adapted from to a degree. Obviously, you know, I'm cherry picking. Uh, and I saw that. I was like, wow, I love this. And then I saw Goodfellas, and then I saw Casino, and Raging Bull, and Taxi Driver. And so, Martin Scorsese was big for me, but my rich, my first Martin Scorsese film, All the Prestige, too, which he did after Batman Begins, I think. That was after Batman Begins. But still, yeah, people might have seen Dark Knight. They check out all his other films before then. I'm sure a lot of people did. But yeah, Martin Scorsese, which was Gates of New York, Goodfellas, all those movies as well, Last Temptation of Christ and stuff. And uh, Sam Raimi is another one for me, chat. I feel like a lot of people, after they saw Spider-Man, they were exposed to Sam Raimi for the first time, and that's when I started to check out his body of work, you know, and all the Evil, the evil Dead films, chat, specifically the Evil Dead films, you know, Evil Dead 1 and 2 and Army of Darkness. So that was here for me, and Spider-Man is what led me to that, chat. So that one, and then my last one I could think of was Peter Jackson, and this was after I'd watched the Lord of the Rings trilogy. It was on like the mid two thousands after this movie come out, and I started to see. I started watching his like earlier, like you know, outlandish, uh, grotesque comedies like Meet the Feebles, Meet the Feebles, and they're they're not your ordinary puppet people. Meet the Feebles, how the song goes, and uh, it's basically like an R rated version or X-rated version in some case of the Muppets. Like, puppets are fucking each other. It's like, oh, my God. So Meet the Feebles was big for me. And also, um, oh, God, what's the other? What's this zombie film in New Zealand? Oh, shit. Brain, I think it's called Brain Dead. Or De it's, it has two different uh, titles, depending on what country you're in. But it's either called Brain Dead or Dead Alive. Brain Dead sounds better than Dead. Like, what the fuck is Dead Alive mean? I guess it means it's supposed to be like, ah, oh, it's a play on Undead. But Brain Dead sounds much better. Rolls off the tongue, chat. Those are the things that I've seen. Uh, but yeah, those are the those are my top ones because we're Nolan Martin, Scorsese, Sam Raimi, Peter Jackson. What about you guys? Trey Bear, good to see you, Trey Bear. Hope you're doing well. Welcome, Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays to you. Talking to the people. Uh, we go because there's watching Looper made me want to go check out Rain Johnson. But yep, yep, yep. Imagine for a lot of people. Um, yeah, you, I mean, he, Brick is an excellent movie. Brothers Bloom is an excellent movie. That's true. Good choices, good choices. Bernie, yeah, Bernie's great. Richard Linklater, I love Bernie. Oh, it's so good. Oh, my God. Jack Black kills it in that role. If you guys have never seen Bernie, do do that. Um, also, uh, uh, School of Rock and, uh, and, and Days of Confuse and so many other great movies. Great choice. I've never seen Wormwood. I've never seen Wormwood. Hi, Summer Baby. Welcome to Stream Summer Baby. Thank you again for that recommendations for Lo-Fi Girl. Exposing me to all sorts of genres of music. It's fun. I've always seen that on YouTube, but I've never clicked on it. I was like, oh, it's like plays this music all day long. But thank you for sending that my way. It's actually going to help, especially as I get my music show going into the new year. It's going to be so much fun. So thank you. Thank you for being here. And Jay-Z and Tim Eddie's, that was great. It was. I liked it a lot. I like to meet the Feebles. It's so far. If you guys have never seen me, the Feebles, I mean, be 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 aware. You're gonna. It's it's a movie that's made to offend. <laughs> made to offend. Puppets are are doing drugs. They're they're murdering each other. They're fucking each other. They're cheating on each other. There's adultery. And there's some wholesomeness to it. There's there's rampages. Uh, yeah, it's uh, it's messed up. Thank you, no pleasure to have you, son, baby. Thank you again. But those are for me. Any others? Any others? You know, I'm trying, I think for like a younger generation. Uh, because I do. Yeah, a lot of you guys are probably. Some of you guys are definitely younger than me. I wonder if you may have seen something like, you know, The, the Departed. Scorsese's Departed, and you, then you saw, like, all of his other films and stuff. 
Yeah, so I'm, I'm curious. Or Chris, I think Christopher Nolan's a really good example. Like, I think for a lot of us, because we all go to see Batman, or Sam Raimi's a great example. We all go to see Spider-Man. It's like, okay, what else did this guy do? And so I think for a lot of those guys that did those huge blockbuster superhero projects or genre films, and we can see their other work, whether they deal in other genres or similar genres. So, yeah, love those. That kid ain't mine. <laughs> That abomination elephant chicken hybrid. That thing looks sick. That thing looks sick. It's gonna die. Doesn't die though. Doesn't die. But it did look ill. Look very. How did that thing get out of that chicken? Chat. That's what I want to know. Make any sense? Ah, oh, but very good question, M. Xavier. Love that question. Thank you, good sir, for being a subscriber on the Patreon. Hope you enjoyed your answer. See, it was thick, girthy, well endowed, and curvaceous and robust. All the above. And now, Chad, we have the last couple questions from Thunder Lee. Uh, with a lot of characters returning to the screen in various Star Wars shows, what character uh, do you personally want to see return that has yet to ever get to be on a TV screen or movie theater screen? Oh, um, let me tell you, Chad. Buckle up, Buttercup. We're going to be here for a while, Chad. Chad, let me tell you about Mara Jade, the assassin, the Emperor's hand. All right? All right? It was his go-to. Yeah, Darth Vader, yeah. But he's like, Mara, you're still my favorite. You're still my favorite. And she was loyal to... Emperor Palpatine to a fault. She would have done anything for Papa Palpatine. He would have said, do it. She would have said, done. And I loved it because eventually she was wooed, Chet. She was wooed by Mark Hamill's Luke Skywalker. Chet, they had a baby and his name was Ben Skywalker and it was great. And I love that. Love Mara Jade. I don't think they'll ever do it because I know that George Lucas hates that character. Uh, but you never know. I think he even specified like you will never adapt Mara Jade. But I love her, Chet. I would love that. I think that's so cool. Jason and Timmy's. Some people probably went back to watch Zenny Villanueva's film. But, oh, it's true. Yeah, I'm sure, like there's so many recent examples. I'm not even considering it. It's like, yep, good point. Well, stuff like Blade Runner 2049 or Prisoners or some of his other works. Yeah, good, 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 good pick. Good pick, Jason. But yeah, Mara Jade, big on my list. I, that, that one is the least likely to happen. I don't think that's ever going to happen, Chad. It's like, all right, I, I'll accept that. I would have liked to have seen Luke have a wife and really shows how the Jedi have grown or not all about that celibacy, Chad, because apparently if you're backed up, you don't let these kids jerk off, all right? You don't let them fuck, then they turn to the dark side, Chad, all right? Just, it's fine. Just let them do that thing. Jesus Christ. They're villainizing sex, Chad. It's just like, it's just like the schools and just like church. Don't villainize it. Explain it. Christ. Another character, Chad. Another Jedi character. Kyle Katarn. Uh, for, you know, we, we, I've been featured in the comics and across multiple video games, Chad. Dark Forces, Jedi Knight, Jedi Academy, all that. A friend of Luke Skywalker, a student of Luke Skywalker, um, a, 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 a Imperial, then a Rebel. And then a Jedi Master, Chad. I would love to see Kyle Katarn. I would, and if they ever wanted to do it now, I mean, what, what, was, what was Luke's Jedi Order like? They want to provide more details and say, okay, it wasn't just him. A couple students say, like, no, they, there were other Masters, too. Maybe there still are other Masters. I think that'd be really fun. Maybe they're in hiding. Kyle Katarn is one of those characters that I'm like, that is ripe for adaptation. There's so many great stories you can do. You can have it take place in the Galactic Civil War era or in the New Republic era, chat. So Kyle Katarn. 100%. Let's go. And let's get more of them Shadows of the Empire characters, Chad. Let me give that Prince Caesar. Give him her Izor. I call him Shizor, Chad. But Prince Shizor, Chad. Okay, he's a Faleen. He's a reptile man. All right. He has a, he has a chip on his shoulder with Darth Vader. He's got, he's got, mm, he's got issues with Vader because Vader committed genocide against his people. And he runs the Black Sun Syndicate, Chad. A criminal empire. And he's made some backroom deals with uh, the Empire for quite some time. Papa Palpatine, Chad. One of Papa Palpatine's people. And uh, he's 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 wanted to get back at Vader for some time. Shadows of the Empire is a fantastic story. They could they I mean they can adapt that if they want to. There's a potential. You got to do some recasting, of course. Do some changes. Let's get Sebastian Stan as Luke. Let's fucking let's just do it. All right. It can. No one will. Be, no, I'm not gonna be mad. Let's just re do it. It's fine. Uh, but Prince Caesar, use him in future shows. I mean, hey, we're clearly with Book of Boba Fett. Boba Fett, Thick Dad, Boba Fett, chat. Would you bet your took us? We're gonna be doing watch parties for that this upcoming Wednesday chat every day. Or excuse me, every Wednesday, Bubba Fett time. Dad bod Bubba Fett. So maybe we'll see Prince Caesar. That'd be a perfect way to introduce him since he's dealing with crime, crime syndicates now. Uh, Talon Karad, chap. Talon Car or Card, excuse me, Talon. I always say Karad. Talon Card, who is a fellow smuggler friend of Han Solo, which introduced in the Thrawn trilogy, helped the New Republic establish itself across the galaxy, chap. Battled Grand Admiral Thrawn, chat, along with the rest of his pirates. But he's great. He's like a he's like a weathered. Han Solo, who's been through it all, and is a little is happier now that he's you know he's made the right choices in his life. But now he wants to help Han and all these kids make the right choices too. Now let me tell you, youngster, you can do it this way. And I like that. Also connected uh, connected to Mara Jade. 
and there they were they were friends and that was like his uh, second lieutenant or that was like his second in command although she did not let him know that he that she was a, a, a agent of the emperor of emperor palpatine chat but you never know they can maybe do that with Ahsoka. I think that'd be fun. Maybe do Ahsoka and Talon card. That'd be fun. And last one, chat. I want a KOTOR adaptation. Let's do Revan. Let's get Darth Revan in there, chat. Let's go back 4,000 years before the Galactic Civil War, before the Death Star, all that Skywalker bullshit. Let's go back in time where the Star Wars is a little old, a little more mysterious, a little more supernatural, a little more weird. Kind of has a much more of a medieval uh, look to it. Let's do that. Let's get Revan. Tell the story of the Starforge chat. This man or woman and her mind being manipulated to do these things on the behest of the Jedi chat but forgetting who or she is. Love that. That's what I want. August, welcome back. Colonel Useless, good to see you. Hope you're doing well. Just talking about Star Wars characters that we want to eventually see make their way to the silver screen or the TV screen. What about you guys? Is there any, I mean, they're doing a good job. Dave Filoni, he's been like, this guy, this guy, this guy. They brought back my boy. They brought back Grand Admiral Thrawn, chat. I'm a big Thrawn lover. You know that. Thick Thrawn, as I like to call him, chat. So... Keep him up. We're getting him in the Soka series. He's going to be the villain. Hope to keep him along, around for a very long time. He's a very interesting character. What about the rest of you guys? Is there anyone else in particular that's like, I would like to see this person? For me, though, I think I covered it. Those are always the ones that I thought were some of the best ones that we haven't gotten yet. And we've gotten some good ones so far. So that's been a, ba that's been a blast. Let's get some more of them bounty hunters, too, chat. That'd be cool. Let's get Dirge. Let's get Dirge back. That'd be kind of fun. He also said, Juicy, do you ever want to talk again anytime soon? Yes, yes, yes. I just waited, I waited, I waited a bit until after the holiday season, just about the Discord stuff. Yeah, exactly. It's just busy. People are busy right now, and I'm super tired. Not going to lie. A little fatigued from last night's stream, so I definitely need to get some rest tonight. Definitely need to get some rest tonight. But yeah, we'll definitely talk. I'll, I'll let you know, but maybe after the holidays will be best, or maybe just before. Uh, maybe even sometime this week, but I'll let you know. Thank you for uh, thank you for uh, messaging me though about it. I do appreciate that. I like your passion. Uh, Star Killer. I see. You know what? I'm just I've never been a Star Killer fan. I just don't. I think he's like he's like he can do anything. He can rip a Star Destroyer from the skies. I'm just like eh. I've never really liked that. I've never liked that. That's the one character I they decanonize, and I'm like I hope you don't bring him back. He was he was just like he's like a Super Saiyan Jedi, and I, I was like eh. it's a little too much for me. I didn't really care for that. He doesn't have to be on time. No, thank you, Colonel. I appreciate it. Thank you for your patience. So, I know a lot of people love Star Killer. Sam Witwer. Hey, Sam Witwer's Darth Maul. He's doing a great job in voicing him, that is. And who knows? They might bring him in for a Star Wars role. Probably not a Star Killer, but, you know, we'll see. Yeah, I, I, want, a, I want a coach adaptation. It's just, yeah, I thought he was just too powerful. It's like, how the, this guy could easily beat Darth Vader. He's fucking throwing ships around in space. It's like, what? And Vader's giving him issues. It's like, eh, eh. Not for me, not for me personally, but I, he has his fans, I know, and people were upset that they had never finished that trilogy, and I get that, and they uh, decanonized him, but who knows, they might bring him back some, maybe, maybe, if they were to bring him back, maybe in a new form, maybe like depower him a little bit, or you know, a lot, if you want to bring him back, he's, a, he's an apprentice of Darth Vader, didn't work out, but you know, he, he turned away from the dark side, I think that'd be cool, just don't make him as powerful, I, that, that's what I'll say. That I'm, that that's, that works better. For, I think everyone gets the best of both worlds. It's like we can have the character, but don't have him be a Super Saiyan God. That's why I'd want them to remove. But you can bring him back. That's fine. Uh, what is uh? This is another question from Thunderly. What is not a Christmas movie that people say it is? Ah, uh, none. You can be whatever you want to be. I mean, today on Discord Discourse, we were having a conversation with our favorite holiday films or Christmas films, and Nia Ducky said, Dante's Peak, and we laughed, but we wanted an explanation as to why, and she said that was a film that her and her family watched a, a, a lot around this time of the year, multiple years over, and so, yeah, I mean, a Christmas movie can be anything. I mean, yes, Christmas movies like, is defined by Christmas, is defined by snow, is defined by the, the general season, the month of December, uh, but a Christmas movie can mean many things to different people. Maybe invokes feelings or emotions from them. Uh, you know, common common themes that we see across these films that you can say like that's related to Christmas. And so, yeah, it's I, I'm not gonna be one of those guys that's like Die Hard is not a Christmas movie and you're a loser. It's like, nah, who cares? I don't care. Yeah, I mean, you think it's a Christmas movie? Sure, why not? Yeah, I, 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 yeah, I think it's a Christmas movie. It's based on Christmas, but it could be anything for anybody. It's very subjective, chat. Very, very subjective. Definitely bring back Dirge. Hell yeah, man. Now to finish The Matrix 4. What's your verdict, Chris? I did not like it. <laughs> I did not like it. I um, uh, I do think it's the worst Matrix movie. I think it's the worst one. 
It is a mess in terms of its storytelling and underwritten characters. Its editing is bad. The action, I, I mean, it's filmed badly, so I assume it's also bad. I yeah, I didn't, I didn't care for it at all. I was, I was very disappointed Snow. and very confused. Uh, yeah, if I had to give it a rating, you know, it's it's one of the worst movies for me. It's one. I mean, but some people are like it. But it's one of the worst movies of the year for me. It's definitely in my worst of list. I can't tell you what it is, but all I can say is Tom and Jerry, you better. Ooh, you got to fight on your hands, Tom. You need to help. You need. You got to put your 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 mutual disdain for each other aside, okay, Tom and Jerry. You need to battle Neil and Co. It's gonna be a rough fucking battle for them. I know people who say the first Harry Potter movie. Yeah, that's true. Christmas. That like you know Harry Potter. People, that was another thing that we brought up today. I forget who mentioned it, but they were saying like a lot of those films came out around. They came out on like in December, within December, and all the time, or maybe November, stuff like that. So it's like, yeah, a lot of people associate Harry Potter with Christmas, and so sure. So yeah, I'm never gonna say it's like that can't be a Christmas. Like, why not? Why not? You know, uh, keep saying nice guys at Christmas movie, but that movie takes place during the summer, and then Flash. Yeah, I mean that's that. I mean that's like a reference to because uh, Shane Black loves the holiday, and he loves to have his movies take place on Christmas. He, that almost felt like, all right, here, Christmas. That felt like he was begrudgingly doing it. <laughs> like, he didn't want to do it, but he's like, here you go. And then all the film fans can go, ooh, ooh, ooh. But that could be Christmas movie we do for other people. It's true. Damn, it's that bad. I, still, I mean, some people liked it. We have people I was talking with today that they liked it. Maybe they had some issues with it, but they liked it. But, yeah, I, I do not like it. And I had recently just come off of Matrix Reloaded and Re Revolutions. I always forget the name of the Matrix 3. Um, and I hate both of those movies, but this most recent film, I'm like, God damn. I was just, it was, it, I was overwhelmed by how, I was overwhelmed by how underwhelmed I was, <laughs> how confused I was. I'm like, this can't be real. This can't be happening. So I was not a fan. I think it pulls all opportunity shit. It's not, I'm not like, I, and the thing is, just to let everyone know, I was skeptical. Sure. You know, but then I saw the trailers. I'm like, you know what? I'm liking these trailers a lot. These look like a lot of fun. I like both of those trailers. Some people didn't like them. I'm like, I like them. You know, you know, I'm not the biggest fan of the Matrix sequels. You know, I, the first one was great, and I like the Animatrix, of course, but the sequels, no fucking thank you. But I was like, oh, no, okay, I'm going to give it a shot. And I, I tried. I tried, Chad. I tried. But they made it so hard. <laughs> and as you're rating, God damn, that's my rating. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, oh, my God. New DT rating. It's like, you got to be, no, it's not, it's not possible. Oh, Lordy. I saw Ryan Theory under the Christmas section Disney Plus. Yeah, well, you know, this is fucking Shane Black again. He loves Christmas. Eh, it takes place around Christmas and winter and stuff, so. Yeah, that's fine. Again, it's, it's you know, Christmas movies are, you, you, it depends on the person you are. I think that's totally okay. Make that a rating. The God damn rating. You got to say it like that. You got to say it like that. That's my new rating, Chad. That's my new rating. Yeah, I'm not even, not even fuck, you know, fuck you. It's, it's more like a God damn, what did I see? I can't believe it. I can't believe it. Oh, so yeah, to answer your question, no, it can be whatever you want it to be. It can be Dante, it can be a Christmas story, it can be Dante's Peak, both for Christmas films. This is a fun question. If you were to pick one horror movie slasher and put them in a Christmas setting, who would it be? I would, um, I would kind of want Candyman. So, in the original Candyman, I think it takes place like in October, November, uh, just because, just you know, it's, it might be even snow on the ground, but it's set in Chicago in the winter, and I like that. He seems like the big pimp coat and stuff. But I would love a Candyman film set in that time. There's something about, like, Chicago with snow on it. I think that'd be really, really cool. Uh, and it'll be, um, yeah, just just, a, just an interesting setting. Because it's always been, because in the most recent movie, it was during the summer, um, I think. Like, spring, summertime, maybe. Maybe fall. But it was, you know, it was, like, hot out and stuff. But I think I think a Candyman film could could use with maybe a total aesthetic change. I was not a big fan of the most recent Candyman. I was super, you guys knew. I was, I was like, oh, can't wait. One of my most anticipated movies of 2021, and I was not a fan. I was very disappointed by the movie. Um, and you guys know I'm a big fan of the original film. A lot reviewed it. I've done audio review commentary for it. Yeah, I've talked about it in length. Tony Todd gives, does a great job as, 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 as Candyman, and Richard Manson does a great job in the movie. So I love how it tackles the themes, and... Yeah, I just thought the new movie was sloppy. It was just a sloppily made movie with unlikable characters. I didn't give a shit about anybody. Not to say that all the perform not all the bad performances are some good performances, but it's just not enough. And it was too scattershot. Like I have no, you know, problem with you know what, what the first Candy Man. It dealt with um, it it dealt with a couple of themes. It dealt with uh uh the economic disparity between poor black, uh Chicago's uh, Chicago people and poor, and rich white people. Who lived within the city, like that was a big theme, and um, you know racial discrimination, 
uh, the new movie tries to cover everything. And, the, and that's that you shouldn't have done that. Like, I, I thought it was exciting. It's like, oh, it's going to tackle gentrification. I was like, oh, that's really cool. That's going to be per perfect for these modern times. Totally. You, you have these these people who are being displaced, you're being pushed out of these neighborhoods, and they're being gentrified, and they're turning everyone's There's a goddamn coffee shop in every corner. All these apartments are now $2,500 per month. It's like, that is really cool. That was nice. And I was like, oh, nice. And it'll do it with over policing. I was like, okay, perfect. But it did that. It did both of those things and everything else. And it didn't focus on those things for very long. It was almost like a cliff notes, and we got that. And okay, we did that. Next scene. Okay, we got that. And it's like, I'm not one of those people like just like don't talk about those things because those those things are real. Those things happen. Those things affect our society. I thought the way they talked about those things or tried to ap apply those things to the movie, it was it was sloppily done. It's like you, why didn't you spend more time? Or why did you just pick a few of these things and then like okay, let's really talk about this and apply it to the film. And yeah, it was it was it was too busy. It was too busy, chat. So yeah, it just wasn't I wasn't a fan. Wasn't a fan. But I would love a Candyman set in the winter. There's something near fairies about that. Very gothic. And it's a very gothic movie. Everything in the second. Can you just imagine the score to Candyman, chat? Da 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 and you have the snow coming down. That's like the opening of the film. And you you have like, you know, I I think that would be awesome. Aesthetically really cool. And I think it'd be kind of cool to see Freddy Krueger in a winter environment. Like Nightmare on Elm Street films, it's always been, I feel like, around fall, mostly spring, summer. That's what I think of Freddy Krueger. It's like hot, hot spring, summer. I don't know because that's related to his fear of fire. I'm not sure, but I think it'd be kind of cool to see a Nightmare on Elm Street take place during the, the winter. I think that'd be really neat. When you got to stay inside, you're all toasty roast, you got to go to sleep, but don't, don't chat because Freddy's going to get you. I think that'd be cool. Chris Ayers. New DT rating brain. <laughs> Jake saw having finally team up with a chemicals. Yes. Dude, people uh, will shut the fuck up about the home loan saw camera. It's true. It's true, though. It's absolutely true. Macaulay Culkin, little Kevin, he grows up to be Jigsaw, chap. I would love an old Republic movie, but maybe not Revan. Maybe even way back to the origin of the Jedi instead. I, th I think we're going to get that. I think that's going to happen. I think we're going to get a Darth Bane series, which I know happens after Revan, but I think we'll get like a Rule 2 series. I love to find a way you could combine midichlorians and progressive training to be a stronger Jedi. See, I just don't, I don't want them to mention midichlorians. I know it's a part of the thing, but I just, I just, I don't even want to mention it. I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to even care. You know, don't demystify the, uh, the, the, the Force Knight Brown. He's like, fart. <laughs> That's what I think. You know, now everybody's saying, I have an opinion. What is it now? Okay. <laughs> Continue. All right. Fair enough. <laughs> Actually, it's fine. That's a perfect way to end it because that is the last question from Thunder Lee Graves. Thank you so much, Thunder Lee, for being a subscriber on the Patreon. Appreciate you, Revenite. Hope you enjoyed your answers, your thick, girthy, well endowed, robust answers. Not just yes, no, or maybe, Chad. I go all the way. I think about these things. I think about these things. And as I said, Chad, we're not going to do the watch party tonight. I'm feeling pretty tired, pretty fatigued. Because we did a 10-hour stream yesterday, Chad. Or nearly 9 hours and 50 minutes. And I need my sleep. I need to go to bed. I'm going to go to bed like right like within a half hour. I need my sleep for tomorrow because I'm going to be on the Sunday service. So I'll probably do a watch party for a Christmas story on Monday, Chad. A belated Christmas gift, if you will. It'll be fun, Chad. With Ralphie and mother and his father and his, his brother and shit and as we learn the origins of of uh you know stark employee peter billingsley chat and how he worked with obadiah stain and great iron manager and also I'm assist jake jillian hall as mysterio quentin beck it'll be good i'm getting all it's true i need my sleep it's true i knew i mean it's like oh shit two o'clock's kind of fucked up i need to get some sleep chase she was of course chris is sleepy i am i'm no i'm really sleepy now i'm super sleepy but it's hard to ignore maybe just maybe you could reboot explanation to why jedi sith things i mean yeah they'll do something they'll do something we're gonna find out like um you know i just i don't like when they did mystify it but we'll see what happens and we'll find out soon it's it is canon nothing i can do about that Get your sleep, sleepy boy. Indeed. Thank you, Chris Ayers. Thank you, Thunder Lee. Get some sleep. Juicy, thank you so much. Jason, get 10 minutes. Chris needs a car from X. Yeah, I need, oh boy, do I. It was a long, two and a half hours. Movie's two and a half hours. Yeah, I know it says two hours, 20 minutes. It's two and a half hours. Just say two and a half. Count tipsy and tired right now and thought you were just saying uh, Ralph and Fines. You know, Ray Fines. Oh, wait a minute, he's not in a Christmas story. No. <laughs> Ralphie, Ralphie, Ralphie Parker. 
Early Park, I guess. Sir, maybe rest well, Chris. Thank you, sir, man. Thank you again for the recommendation. But yeah, shit, I will be heading out. I hope you enjoyed the stream. Merry Christmas to you. Uh, you know, happy holidays to you. Whatever you're celebrating, Chad. Happy Chinese food, Jewish national holiday. It's an absolute pleasure. We're going to be doing a New Year's Eve stream, Chad. We're going to ring in the New Year Friday. That'll be really, really fun. Can't wait for that. But of course, I'll be streaming the rest of the week. I need my rest. I need my sleep. 